Charlie Hudson here for Reandertal. I'm coming to you from my friend's apartment in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm staying for the 2013 Ancestral Health Symposium. I was not actually planning to shoot any video today, but um, I was recording some audio for reference. And then I wandered into this Kyle Maynard presentation, and I didn't had no idea um, what I was getting into, what it was going to be about. Um, and then about two-thirds of the way through, I just had to get out the camera. Things just got too real and too physical for audio to do them any justice. Now there is going to be an official video. It'll probably be much higher quality um, than what I've got for you. Um, it's going to be publicly um, free and, and open to the public. Um, but in the interim, um, while they're still getting that together, I humbly offer you um, this video which I shot from my seat. You're looking through these tree clearings though and you're seeing on the top it's snow and ice on the summit, so it looks like a totally different planet. And as we're going along the first couple days, we're having a good time, you know, we're laughing, joking with each other, and like, you know, I'm just walked in about six to seven hours per day in this like bear crawl. And by the third day, my arms and my feet started, by the third day, my arms and my feet started swelling up a lot. And by the fourth day, it was basically all I could think about. The pain had become so bad, it was like hard to concentrate on anything else. And we had projected it's gonna take 15 days to reach the summit. So the fourth day we crossed up above the tree line. My friends, we were, you know, that I was laughing and joking with before, and now like I could barely like even, you know, stomach to like hear them laughing and joking. So I was in a totally different place. Mentally I could only think about that pain. I told them I was like, just go and hike ahead. I'll catch up. So they did, and um, I had about 20 minutes. I was with a few of our, our guides, and just kind of alone in my thoughts. And I was thinking, like, if it hurts this bad on the fourth day, what's day nine going to look like? What's day 12 going to look like? And we pulled in this camp called the Pachira Plateau. It was about 12,000 feet, starting to get cold outside. And a bunch, there's maybe 100 or so other climbers there in the mountain. And as, uh, as we pulled into the camp, my friends that had made it before you know, shared our story, what we were doing. People wanted me to take pictures and stuff like that. And like, normally it would have been something I would have loved to have done. And at that point, like I was like, I was just in so much pain. I told them, I was like, I just need to be alone. And I was, felt discouraged, dejected, went and walked inside my tent, lay there by myself on top of my sleeping bag for a while and about an hour just lay there and cried. And I started thinking, I was like, one of the reasons why we were there was to provide hope for some of our heroes in the military that had sacrificed their limbs literally for our freedom. I thought this isn't gonna provide a whole lot of hope for these troops now that I can't even make the third of the way up this mountain. And I really started crying when I started thinking about a promise that I was close to breaking. And it was from a mom that I met out in Arizona before we left for the trip, and her name was Vicki. She'd been a mother of a Marine in May of 2011 and had lost his life in a firefight in Afghanistan and he saved several other Marines before he passed away. His name is Corey Johnson. She had, he had a wife and three daughters that one daughter he hadn't met yet. She'd been born after his last deployment. And she said he had this passion to travel, to see the world, to we talked about climbing Kilimanjaro, and out of the blue in this gym, she looked me in the eye and she asked me, would you promise to bring Corey's ashes to the summit? I promised her there that I would. And laying in that tent, I can tell you, that was the only thing in that moment, in that darkest moment, that kept me going. And I, I think in order for any of us to reach that potential and what we're capable of in our lives, you have to find a why. Corey in that moment became my why. 
the pain didn't go away, but I, I got real with where I was pain threshold wise, and I made a decision there in that moment. I was like, I'm not going to come back home and tell Vicky that I didn't make it. And so we decided to look at our alternatives and decided to go up and take a risk on a route that was called the Western Breach up the western side of the mountain that fewer than 1% of climbers on Kilimanjaro take. This is a route that's full of ice and snow, basically. So with a small ice spike fitted for my arm, uh, the ice spike in my right arm was kind of malfunctioning, and, and smaller ice spikes for my feet, uh, my right arm was basically useless because of the malfunctioning ice spike. I had three points of contact for the ninth day we're taking on, we had to pass through 3,000 feet of ice and snow. So we're going along, and, and the rule of mountain climbing is to always have three points of contact down at all times, so I'm breaking this rule already without with my malfunctioning ice pipe. And started off in these ice fields, the only thing you could see is just to go on for hundreds of feet at a time. And just We started at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., we're hiking, woke up at 2. You just barely see just you know, 10, 15 feet in front of you from your headlamp and shining off the ground. And so, as we're going through these ice fields, I would I'd get my firm footing and snap and punch into the ice. Step through these ice fields, punch through the ice. Halfway through this first big field, I didn't punch into the ice hard enough. The ice spike on my left arm slid out from underneath me. I went belly down in the sheet of ice and slid several feet in a second. My guy jumped on me, bear hugged me, probably saved my life. My heart rate was through the roof. You know, tunnel vision came in, all that you know, nervous system response that we know too well. I mean, was all jack. It was my uh, in the immediate thing that came into my head then in that moment there was a mantra that just like kept repeating over and over and over again that I'd heard from a Navy SEAL. And the mantra was, not dead, can't quit. And I just kept repeating this, not dead, can't quit. And I'd ask myself periodically throughout that day, are you dead? Nope, can't quit. <laughs> it was um, give us 12 hours across the Western Breach. Slept at 18,500 feet, woke up with a layer of ice on top of our sleeping bags, and sleeping three to a tent. And that next morning, just pushed through another, uh, it was uh, 900 feet, 1,000 feet to go, stand at the roof of Africa. 19,340 feet. I had to go and take it in for about an hour almost before anyone showed up, any other climbers. And, uh, I have to have that time to go and pay tribute to Corey. And the most amazing thing happened was it was two and a half days to come back down the mountain. And as we came back down, then the very next day, we got to take a shower, which was pretty awesome. I hadn't showered in 12 and a half days. But we got to go and visit a school for kids with disabilities. And at this school, there were about 80 blind students, 25 albino students. And these kids had been, because of their disability in Africa, were cast out of their families, couldn't contribute to the subsistence culture, and they were orphans, uh, and allowed to go to uh, private school because of being blind and albino. About a hundred of them went and gathered around me, and I was giving them a talk, translated through their headmaster in Swahili. And I was, they were about 10 years old, so I'm talking to them, and you know, toned down a little bit. You know, we're talking about climbing this big mountain in their backyard, but the kids got so excited and fired up, they just like started spontaneously on their own, like chanting something, like over and over and over again. And so I was like asking their headmaster, like, what are they chanting? What are they chanting? They're chanting in Swahili. So he has them start chanting in English. And what they were chanting was, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. I sat back there, though, and I was, like, reflecting on that. And I was like, I don't think this would have been possible for me if, if I didn't have, like, Corey in that moment becoming my wife. <clears throat> I, I don't think that any of us can reach our potential in our lives and you know, do what we're capable of doing and help the people that we are if we don't find ours. So I challenge you, you know, find your why. Find your truth and realize then, I think anything really is possible. Thank you guys very much.